Good evening. Welcome to our Thursday night Torah learning. Tonight I hope to present what is in effect my Rosh Hashanah sermon for the second day. The sermon for the first day I delivered last week and it's recorded and you can listen to that. I want to really thank everyone who is joining tonight. Tonight is such a busy night, the night before Rosh Hashanah, and that people are willing to take time to study Torah together uh, is something that is very gratifying and I appreciate it. And it is an honor for me to be with you uh, at this time. There is great variation in how each of us is affected by this pandemic. There are many who tragically have lost their lives. There are many who have suffered alone. There are many who have a loved one who passed away or was or is sick and they were not able to visit. To know that you have a loved one at such a time who is suffering alone is one of the most painful experiences in life. Now, if you are not directly affected like this, you may be unaware of the depth of heartache some of us have suffered. Others face financial ruin their lives may never be the same. And many of us have inconveniences to a lesser or greater extent. Not being able to see our family. Wearing a mask. But there is at least one common denominator that most of us are suffering. And that is the illusion that we are in control of our lives has collapsed. Will we get sick? Will we survive? When will this end? When will the rules change? It's happening to us. Many of us experience we don't run our lives anymore. It's happening to us. And the longer this goes on, the deeper this particular malaise gets. Rosh Hashanah is approaching. We want to be able to observe it properly. We want to be able to pray properly but we can't even control that. I would say, as I speak to people every day, that this is one of the most serious problems we face. Aside from actual crisis. And even in a crisis, this loss of control is always present. And if this is our biggest problem today, then these two solutions are the most important messages I can share with you. And what I want to share with you tonight is partially based on the thinking and writing of Rabbi J.J. Schachter. And that is that there are two critical areas of life we do control if we are attuned to them. And when we are attuned to them, how we experience our lives this year can be vastly improved. I have been working on formulating these ideas for a long time. And I can tell you from my experience, they work. 
Now, I need to say this to you in an oblique manner in order to protect confidentiality. Yesterday, I was working on preparing this shear, this class, as I have been for many, many days and weeks. Now, any day close to Rosh Hashanah is hectic for every rabbi. That goes with the territory. But there were things going on yesterday afternoon, things that could affect all of us. And I was powerless to control any of it. There were rumors of rule changes. I couldn't verify it. I, there was confusion over what the details might be. I was simply waiting to get answers. There was nothing I could do about it. And I was feeling yesterday afternoon seriously besieged and passive, waiting for bad news with no way to control it. And I was trying to concentrate on preparing this class. It wasn't going well. And in the middle of all that, an opportunity came to me to follow one of the suggestions that I'm going to share with you. And that single act changed my entire outlook. It didn't solve the problems, but it transformed how I felt about them. What I am going to share with you tonight really works. So let's start with a narrative from Sefer Malachim, the Book of Kings. It's a narrative that occurs about halfway through the first temple period and it relates to an incident in the life of Elisha. Elisha is a prophet who was the student, the disciple of Eliyahu. Elijah the prophet, when he passed away, the prophet that took his place was Elisha. And we learn in the book of Kings about a woman who had suffered greatly. Her husband had passed away. She was in dire poverty. And because of her debts, her creditors threatened to take her children into indentured servitude to pay off her debts. And so she turned to Elisha the prophet and she cried out to him in her suffering. Elisha. And Elisha said to her, Tell me, my Yeshlok Baboyas, what do you have in your house? And she said, I don't have anything. All I have is a container of olive oil. So he said to her, Go to your neighbors and borrow from them all of the empty vessels that they can lend to you. The empty pots, the empty pitchers, the empty vessels. Borrow all of them and bring them into your house. And then Elisha performed a miracle. And the oil that was in the one container that she had miraculously expanded and filled all of the vessels that she had borrowed. So now she had this large amount of very high quality olive oil. And he said to her, go to the market and sell the oil. And from the proceeds, you'll be able to support yourself. And she did so. And she was able to support herself due to the miracle Elisha had performed for her. Okay. That's the narrative. Let's analyze it for a moment. 
This woman was in crisis. Elisha is a Navi. He is a prophet. And one of the roles that a prophet has, he performed miracles. And because of his miracle, this woman was saved and the crisis was averted. But notice, he didn't just give her money. He didn't even give her oil to sell for money. And he didn't ask, do you have anything in your house? Rather, he said to her, Ma yesh lach babayis. What is it that you have in your house through which I can help you? What is it that you have means you have something. I know that you have something to help yourself with. I know that you have something because everyone has something to help themselves with. You may not realize it, but you have the solution to your problem already. My job as a Navi, as a prophet, is to point out to you what you have already that will help you. And my, the second part of my job is to help you magnify what you already have. But Elisha is saying, I don't create the solution. The solution is already there. You need to look for it. And you need to recognize it. And then I can help you bring it to fruition. We're facing difficult challenges. And we're also trying to help others who are facing difficult challenges. We're trying to find for ourselves and we're trying to help find for others the wherewithal, the support, the advice to be able to meet these challenges. But here's the key that Alicia teaches us. We have it. We have the answers. We just need to find them. I need to find what I already have. And you need to find what you already have. And both of us need to help each other find what we already have. Are you healthy right now? Some of us are not. But are you healthy right now? If your answer is yes, you have a tremendous blessing. Don't take it for granted. You control your body. You can walk, you can talk, you can enjoy a view, you can feel satisfied. That's amazing control. Build on that. Think of all of the parts of your life that you do control. And if you look for it, you will find it. Let me share just one example. Many of us know a remarkable man, Rabbi Labish Hundert. He lived here for many years. Labish is a brilliant, spiritual, unique man. And he has had and continues to have deep impact on so many people especially young people. He and his family now live in Israel. And he is recovering from COVID. 
Listen to what he wrote recently on Facebook. Dear, dear Hevra, one great big amen to your blessings and well wishes. I am tasting things again. Quite amazing. <coughs> blessings for a wonderful, healthy new year. May we all emerge like butterflies with all kinds of surprising new colors and patterns of energies and abilities. <coughs> That's Labish. To be able to once again taste and to recognize how amazing that is. Labish is one who has refined and elevated looking at what he has and how by exercising his control over his awareness and appreciation, he can grow from this terrible disease. Whenever you have a challenge, especially now, ask yourself, Ma yesh li babayis. What do I already have? What do I already have that I can use to help myself? Because you have the answer. You have the solution. It's just a matter of focusing on it and enhancing it. Allow me to share a second approach. And it's based on a startling passage in the Talmud. If we think about the problems that are facing us today, this feeling that we lack control over our lives, if we try to associate our predicament with one of our patriarchs from the Torah, who might we feel can relate best to what we are going through now? Well, certainly not Avraham. Abraham, he was a man of action. He created his own destiny. He found God. He travels to Israel. He enters a covenant with God. He does bris milah on himself. He starts Jewish history. Avraham stands up to God, defending the evil people of Sodom. Avraham was certainly in control of his life. He would have no way to relate to what we're going through. Yaakov, our patriarch Jacob, likewise, would have no way to relate to our difficulty. Yaakov takes the blessing from his older brother, finds a wife for himself, actually four wives. He amasses a fortune. He raises a family that becomes Klal Yisrael, the Jewish people. And he sets the pattern for Jewish life up to and including today. Yaakov would not be able to relate to our situation. But Yitzchak, Isaac. Yitzchak could relate. Of all the patriarchs, Yitzchak is the most passive. Things happen to him. He is literally bound on an altar. Akedas Yitzchak means the binding of Isaac. His father Avraham was active. Yitzchak, Isaac, was passive. A wife is found for him. His blessing is taken from him. And when the Torah describes his blindness, we understand that for Yitzchak, it is also a metaphor for his inwardness, his passivity, his quietness. Yitzchak is not in control of his life. 
So let's learn a passage of Talmud together that will overturn everything we think we know about our patriarch Yitzchak. It's a passage in the Talmud, Masech the Shabbos. And the Talmud says as follows. La'asid lavo. At some point in the future, at which point in the future? Maybe now. Yom Allah Kadosh Baruch Avram, God will approach Abraham, the spirit of Avraham. And he will say to Avraham, Banecha Chatuli, your children, Avraham, the Jewish people, your children have sinned. What should I do? God will ask Avraham. Avraham answers, Ribona Shalolam, Master of the Universe, Yimachu al Kedusha Hashem. Let them be obliterated for the sanctity of your name. That's harsh. That's Avraham, who we know of as the father of compassion. He defended the evil people of Sodom. He's known for all history as the most gracious host, the most compassionate person. And when God comes to him and says, your children, that's us, have sinned, Avram says, they broke the rules, they suffer the consequences. It's really harsh. God is not satisfied with that answer. Amor Yaakov. God says, I'm going to go ask Yaakov. Tahavale Tzar Gidl Banim. Yaakov had trouble with his own children. I'm going to ask him the same question. Notice, by the way, God doesn't even ask Yitzchak. If Avraham, who is so compassionate and kind and strong, And in control, Avram just throws up his hands and gives up and says, we'll just wipe them out. God doesn't even ask Yitzchak. Skips right over him and goes to Yaakov. Maybe Yaakov, Yaakov, you had trouble with your own children. Maybe you're going to be a little bit more compassion to the children of Israel named after you. Maybe Yaakov will beseech God for compassion. Amalek, God says to Yaakov, Your children have sinned. Amalefan of Yaakov answers, Ribona Shalolam, Master of the Universe, Yemachu al Kedusha Hashem, wipe them out. They didn't keep your rules. That's it. It's hard to understand. Yaakov had children that made terrible mistakes. The brothers against Yosef. Yosef against the brothers. And yet when God approaches him to defend us, also his children, Yaakov has nothing to say. Okay, finally, there's nobody left to ask except Yitzchak. He's the only patriarch. Armaloli Yitzchak. So God says to Yitzchak, he's the only one left. Your children have sinned against me. Now, please listen to this quiet, passive, not in control of his own life, never willing to speak up response from Yitzchak. Ribono Shalola, master of the universe. First of all, Bonai. Velo Bonecha? What do you mean they're my children? God, they're your children. 
You're coming to me like I should have to defend them because they're my responsibility. Master Universe, they're your children before they're my children. Why should I be asked to defend them? You should defend them, God. Yitzchak says, can you imagine saying to God? It's your job to defend them. Don't ask me. Then he says, Va'od, and furthermore, how much really did they sin? Are they really so terrible? Did they really do so many sins? Now listen to this carefully. It's incredible. How long does a person live? What's the average? Okay, different people live different numbers of years, but we have a famous verse, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Let's just take the number 70. Okay, the number 70. Dal Esrin, Delo Anashtalayu. First of all, let's take away the first 20 years because God does not punish a person for the sins they commit during the first 20 years. That's an amazing thing. A person is responsible in human court for their actions once they reach bar or bat mitzvah. But a person is actually not subject to punishment from heaven until they reach the age of 20. So out of 70 years, take off 20 because you can't hold the person accountable for the first 20 years. It's an amazing statement. All right, what do we have left? 50 years. Well, Pashulu Esrin Vakamisha, take away half right off the bat, 25, because it's nighttime. Right? Half of 50 years is nighttime. You can't sin at night. What kind of a sin can you do at night? You can't even see at night. There are no sins at night. The only opportunity to do a sin is in the daytime. So you're left with 25 years. Out of 25 years, he says, take away 12 and a half. Because <coughs> out of 25 years of daytime, at least half of that time is spent in prayer, and eating, and using the restroom. Between praying and eating and using the restroom, that's half the time of our daylight hours. So you only have 12 and a half years left that a person could possibly sin. So first of all, God, before you hold the Jewish people accountable for their sins, let's just get some perspective. We're talking about a little bit. Okay. 12 and a half years of potential sins. Now listen to what he says. God, you know what? It's only 12 and a half years. Forgive them for the 12 and a half years. You take the responsibility. Just wipe it clean. Where does Yitzchak, this quiet, meek, passive person, get the energy to defend the Jewish people with such ferociousness? Where does he get the backbone to stand before God and say, ignore what Avraham said, ignore what Yaakov said, I, Yitzchak, will not allow this to happen. Let's listen to the rest of the passage. He says to God, you should forgive them for the 12 and a half years of potential sins. Vimlav, and if you, God, are not willing to forgive them for their sins, palga alai, upalga alecha. I'll split it with you. You forgive half, I'll take responsibility for the half. Take it on my check. Take it on my account. Vim tim kulam alai, 
And if you say to me, God, that you're not willing to forgive any of it, put it all on me. I take responsibility. Hakravis nafshi kamach. I already sacrificed myself before you on the altar. I was willing to give up my life. Use that to forgive the sins of the Jewish people. Yitzchak defends the Jewish people because he is in control. What is he in control of? He controls his decision to sacrifice himself for his family. For his people. He is willing to sacrifice himself to help others. And every one of us has the same control in our lives. I'm sure you've heard this story before. It's told movingly by Fred Rogers. And it is definitely worth repeating. It's a story from a number of years ago that happened during the Seattle Special Olympics. And in the Special Olympics in Seattle, there was a hundred yard dash. And there were nine contestants, all of them people that we would refer to as having a disability, either physical or mental disability. All nine of them assembled on the starting line and at the sound of the shot, they began to run. But almost immediately, one little boy stumbled and fell. And he hurt his knee and he started to cry. The other eight children running heard him crying. And they all turned around and ran back to him. One little girl bent down and kissed his knee and said, this will make it feel better. The little boy got up and he and the rest of the runners linked their arms together and they ran together and they reached the finish line at the same moment. And when they did, everyone in the stadium stood up and clapped and whistled and cheered for a long time. People who are there are still telling this story. And you know why? Because deep down, we know that what matters in this life is not winning for ourselves. What really matters is helping others win too. Even if that means slowing down and changing our course now and then. Every one of us has multiple opportunities to sacrifice winning for ourselves in order to help someone else win too. You are in control of this. Take control of your life by helping others win. Rabbi Yosef Konevsky is a rabbi in Los Angeles. And back in March, at the beginning of this pandemic, he wrote the following words. Every hand that we don't shake must become a phone call that we place. Every embrace that we avoid must become a verbal expression of warmth and concern. Every inch and every foot that we physically place between ourselves and another must become a thought as to how we might be of help to that other should the need arise. 
you and I control our lives when we do this. And finally, on Rosh Hashanah specifically, we can pray. Yes, of course, we pray for ourselves, but we can pray for others. My grandfather used to quote this. There is one question we must all ask God on Rosh Hashanah. Who gave me this sweet and gave my brother dust to eat? And when will his ship come in? You want to be in control of your life? Decide who you are willing to help and how. And you will be in control of your life. I promise you, from my own personal experience, you will never feel as in control of your life as when you are helping another person. My friends, I want to wish every one of you Shana Tova, a new year of good health and joy and happiness and a feeling of control that comes from helping another person to win too. Thank you very much.